everyone. My name is Primrose Pineda. On behalf of Park System Southeast Asia, we'd like to thank you for joining us today for the last installment of our webinar series on nanoscale research using AFM and techniques. Before we begin, let me give you a quick overview of today's session. The presentation would take approximately 50 minutes, which should allow us some time for a few questions at the end. Your mics have been disabled by default to give our speaker an uninterrupted speaking experience. After the conclusion of the talk, we will then go back to the series of questions that we have received. We will answer them in sequence to the best of our ability. And if time does not permit for all the questions, we will send a follow-up email to attendees to answer those additional questions. At this point, I would like to give a short introduction on our speaker. Zoe Kim is an application engineer at Park Systems Korea. Her role includes, but is not limited to, surface inspection and mechanical lithography on display panel, semiconductor devices, and battery samples with electrical, mechanical, and thermal analysis. She is also assigned in writing technical articles for publications. She received her bachelor's degree in physics from Incheon National University and her master's degree from Sung Kung Wan University, South Korea. Without further ado, it is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this webinar, Zoe Kim of Park Systems. Hello, everyone. My name is Zoe Kim. I'm one of the uh, application science scientists team in headquarter. And today I'm going to talk about the scanning capacitance microscopy, an advanced analysis for nanoscale semiconductor surface. Among many inspection techniques for semiconductor sample, STM surely gives the direct information of the quality and the functionality of the device. To comprehend how the scanning capacitance microscopy works, I'll just uh, simply start right away uh, on the what semiconductor is, basically, and how do they make it these days, and move on to the basic principle of the capacitance voltage reaction to how we detect the capacitance signal. So most of the semiconducting material is based on the silicon substrate. To make the silicon electrically active, a material with or without an electron can be injected or diffused to the silicon substrate, which is called doping process. And if an arsenide atom is doped to the silicon, we can get an extra electron doped on the silicon, which is called N-type semiconductor. Or P-type semiconductor if a boron atom is doped. When those N or P-type is attached to one another, we call it P-N junction. And the electron and holes from P-N and P-type semiconductor is just naturally attracted to each other, which gives a flow of charges. If a voltage bias is applied to a proper direction, this junction material will make a certain amount of current. If an NPN junction is made, which is the picture in the middle, this flow is stuck in the middle. So even under a potential pressure to the charges, there will be no current. But if we make a dielectric material on top of this NPN junction, and apply a voltage to it, we can. We can make the current flow. If we apply plus voltage to the um, dielectric material, a negative charge will be attracted to the top of the P-type material, which will make a channel of negative charges in between the N-type materials. This is the basic principle of MOS-FET, MOSFET structure. If you control the doping concentration of the each of this material, then we can get a precise control of the threshold voltage, which make the channel of in between anti-material to make this kind of flow of invert inverse charges. So nowadays, this device is getting smaller and smaller and leaving few nanometers, which means few layers of atom left between other functional materials. We have to make the device scale smaller as possible to make 
let's say a whole computer can be inside of a tiny smartphone. Not only that scaling down matters, this kind of scaling down problem actually started from material study. For instance, the dielectric insulator layer should be thin enough to make a high working output with small applied voltage. But this can be not too thin so that the layer leaks the current right through it, which makes the device fabrication really tricky. We are using this intricate technology to day-to-day -to -day our lives when we turn on or turn off the alarm to get up and got to work using a vehicle with uh, all kinds of these kind of memory devices is already embedded. So how to construct the device can also enhance its performance. Like uh, FinFETs, there's a different various type of uh, memory devices like FolkFETs or NAND device with 3D integrated structures. Now the performance of the devices and the fabrication process is much easier and better. Of course, to make an analysis on this kind of devices, with this kind of sample scale, the metrology itself needs to make the accordance to uh, uh, of its resolution. For that matter, SCM is the best option for this kind of nanoscale measurements, which gives the topographic and electrical information simultaneously. With its few nanometer tip size, which decides the resolution of the total data, SCM tip touches the sample and measures the capacitance reaction by the applied bias by the system. We can test the device functionality or run a failure examination while the tip scans the surface gathering the topography and the SCM data in nanoscale. Before I mentioned that the device, like MOSFET, reacts to the voltage bias in a certain way. Let's make more specific example using a, using a sample of P-type MOSFET device. Under gradually increasing voltage bias, the P-type semiconductor accumulates its charges at first top layer, which meets the insulator that we can call this gate oxide. When the applied bias make uh, overcome the material's Fermi level, this depletes the top layer and attracts the opposite charges and not just the holes making its electrically capaci uh, electrical capacity lower. And then if the bias is high enough over the threshold voltage, inverted charges are extracted to the top layer with opposite charges to be extremely pushed down to the other side. At this status, the capacity becomes lower and lower than the depletion status. And with proper source drain bias applied, a current will flow, which is on status of semiconductor device. Of course, the reaction will happen in the other way if the material is N-type semiconductor and also with different doping concentration. More accurately, this reaction is a bit different when an alternating bias is applied or the frequency of the AC bias is high. Then let's make a simplified example to the situation where our n-type material semiconductor reacts like, like this curve, CV curve. As the AC bias is applied, the charges will pull the or push to the top following the alternating bias frequency. With light lead of the material, the reaction will freely happen while the reaction will be slowing down for heavily doped material. So the variation of the capacitance signal under same amplitude of AC bias, heavily doped material will have smaller uh, DC, which is capacitance delta value. So to sum up, under an alternating bias, N-type and P-type semiconductor will have the opposite phase reaction in synced uh, frequency. With higher doping concentration, the DC by the DV is smaller than the lightly doped material case. 
Then, how do we read this DCDV signal and interpret the low data? First, we have to make sure that the sample and the tip consist of this MOS structure, metal oxide and semiconductor structure, just like MOS MOSFET as we discussed. But in AFM tip and sample wise, it's in a vertical way. With a given sample surface area, a distribution of different capacitive properties should be lied underneath the oxide layer, whether it's uh, imprinted oxide layer or naturally uh, created oxide layer. And the SCM tip, which is conductive with the metal coating layer on top of silicon material, presses down the surface. Then with an alternating system bias applied between tip and sample, making a depletion layer at the tip contacted area. This small nanoscale region will react to the AC bias and will instantly give a DC DV signal to the tip. As the tip fills the DC DV signal, the signal is connected to a strip line, which is connected to the SCM resonator, as indica indicated is in this yellow box. Inside there, two electrical lines are surrounding the strip line like this. One is source, which is antenna line, and the other detector, the pickup line. The source line is just constantly gives a radio frequency signal to its line. And as the strip line fills and spread through the uh, vibrating signal from the sample, this affects the resonating radio frequency signal. Then the detecting pickup line will be shifted from its original source signal. Finally, the transformation is sent back to the lock-in amplifier of our AFM controller where the alternating bias for the tip sample depletion was generated. But before we summarize the whole thing or the whole scheme, the shifting radio frequency signal needs more explanation. In a series of resonance, resonance circuit like uh, the SCM resonator, the frequency shift by the capacitance change following this presented relation. Since the capacitance change is following the AC bias applied to the tip and the sample, that means that uh, capacitance difference, which is DC, is vibrating, which in turn will result of vibrating peak shift of the radio frequency signal peak in this RF amplitude and frequency graph. So from the original radio frequency source, which is a black line in the middle of radio frequency peak, pickup line is reading a constantly vibrating uh, peak shift signal. This signal is sent to the locking amplifier and dissected into the SCM amplitude and SCM phase signal in a way we can understand. By applying this serial resonator circuit to read the signal, the signal is amplified for one thing. And also, we can read a wide range of capacitance property from like metal material to extremely low doping concentration level. So overall, in PAC systems setup, SCM setup, we can get a signal from a variety of sample type with enhanced high signal ratio, signal to ratio. Now let's uh, move on to the actual data, and I'm gonna show you how to interpret them based on few example of the SM data. And also, I'm gonna introduce another key factor of Park Systems SCM, a uh, quick step SCM, and then. I'm going to finally show you the actual demonstration of SCM measurement using a smart scan. Let's say we have a surface with this dopant array with P 
and highly doped P, N and highly doped N material in a series. And tip is scanning the surface in X direction. So that means in a line, we can see all of these components in a single profile. First of all, the raw data will react highly doped area with low capacitance difference and big DCDV capacitance difference from just P and N normally doped area. This amount of doping concentration is displayed in uh, SCM amplitude signal. Because the amplitude signal is from in phase of the detected raw data signal, which is synced with the phase offset with only amplitude of the vibration can be extracted. But without the phase offset, we cannot know the charge signal, whether it's n-type or p-type. That specific information is included in the SCM phase. So SCM amplitude is showing the concentration of the dopants, and SCM phase is showing the charge, whether it's n or p-type. So to see the doping charge type and concentration at the same time, we have to look over SCM phase and SCM amplitude separately. And to ease this kind of complexity of the data analysis, there's a SCM quad channel, the quadrate signal, quadrate signal of the detected low data. This SCM quad signal can give these two information in one scope of image. If the signal is above zero value, in this case, that means that the sample is p-type. And if it is below zero, that means that the sample is n-type. And also, the higher value of the SCM quad means that the sample is low with the low doping. On the other hand, if the value is small, that means that the doping concentration is really high. Actually, whether the p-type will have above or below the zero value can be changed by locking amplifier settings. So it's not really an absolute value. And this is the actual measurement example on a surface of erasable PROM device. So it's simply called EPROM, actually. We can see an array of amplitude values from the written pattern on the sample surface, which is also has a different phase values. Since the amplitude value of the SCM signal changes by the doping concentration, we can make the reference of the measurement measured SCM amplitude value to actual dopant level by measuring an assured calibration sample. By measuring a calibrated area with known doping concentration level, we can get the SCM amplitude value and also SCM phase at the same time. Matching those amplitude levels to each of these concentration level, as we know, we can get other samples doping information also. But for this, we have to have a consistent parameter setting in between the measurement and the tip. So it's really a tricky measurement, and this could lead us to tip and standard variation. And another example to help SCM phase channel comprehension, this FAT sample has no discernible figure in the height, which is the far left image. But in SCM phase signal, there is a clear description of P region inside a big n-type well. And inside the p-pad, p-type material pad, there is a small pattern of n-type dots uh, doped spots, which is few nanometer, few micrometer size. If the, there is a defected area of the device, like this kind of case, we can see, we can, of course, analyze them by the SCM data. The SCM data shown here is an actually uh, SCM quad channel, which can give us the whole information of n-type or p-type or the concentration of each doping material. 
In the scanned area, there is a different type of material with various doping ratio, actually. You can see the uh, yellowish color of P type, P plus type here, and N plus type in the bottom. It's really highly doped. That's why its uh, color is not uh, strong enough. And in the scanned area, uh, which has very strong uh, color, like yeah, uh, white, almost white, over yellowish color, there's a shortage between P plus type paths where it should be uh, disconnected if the device is OK. This SCM measurement is quite sensitive to other stray capacitance signal and even from a rough topographic factor. To enhance this kind of signal instability from other factors, Hox Systems offers a unique scanning method, a quick step scan SEM. Compared to conventional raster scanning with certain scan speed, quick step adds a static motion between the data acquisition. We can add the acquisition time as much as we want so that the measurement is not averaging throughout the surface, which ends up being not accurate, or the signal itself is getting smaller and smaller because of the uh, too much averaging time. By adding this kind of function, we can avoid unnecessary slowing down like this. The quick step uh, SCM scan rate is really high, but this scanning method is just uh, stops at every point and averaging just the necessary time so we can get an accurate data compared to the raster scanning. The, even though the scan rate is really small, like 0.2 hertz, the scanned data, the line profile is much worse. Of course, if the scan rate increases, the data can be getting worse and worse. To sum up, the quick step SCM is faster with high resolution. And the sensitivity is also high. So overall, its productivity is really good. Uh, and let's move on to the actual SCM measurement using our smart scan software. OK. So now we're looking at the smart scan. I'm going to show you the demonstration of actual SEM measurement. Um, since you guys already, maybe some of you guys already saw the webinar before using the PFM or the webinar before. Uh, so I'm just going to skip the detailed uh, explanation about the software itself and just going to measure the SEM mode. But before we get into the measurement right away, I already uh, set up the cantilever and the sample. What we're going to measure today is a sample, semiconductor sample, which is a cross-section with different doping level and different type of the do dopant carrier is already embedded. So let's see the sample surface first. This is the sample surface we're going to measure. On top of this pad, there's uh, low doped N type and highly doped N type and low doped P type. Highly doped P type is already embedded in vertical line. So if you measure the sample surface in axis scale, then we're going to see of SCM amplitude difference slowly decreasing by the increasing of dopant concentration and N type P type difference. The uh, information about this sample is really kind of specific. If you look at it, this is the um, the whole scale of the sample surface, and this is uh, the sample is from uh, Infineon, which is a calibration sample with different dopant layer is already uh, set it like this. If the color scale decreases and it's red, the dopant layer is different. It's slowly increasing like this, and each level of this uh, sample with the uh, step, the dopant concentration is uh, set it like this. So if there's a P type with this kind of highly doped, uh, low doped um, area, this has 
certain amount of dopant carrier is already set. It. So if you measure the SCM amplitude it's using the smart scan and compare this actual dopant uh, concentration level, then move on to the sample we don't know about. We can connect the amplitude value of that sample connect uh, by uh, the data we already measured in this sample surface. So it's a calibration sample in a simple way. Then let's uh, start right away on the measurement. The cantilever is a little bit far from the sample surface, so I'm going to move closer. And once I click the approach button here, the software will automatically approach the tip to the sample surface. But before it really approaches the sample surface, I'm going to change the head mode to SCM. And right now, this yellow bar, this uh, yellowish bar is fully down. That means that Z scanner connected to this cantilever is fully down and not feeling anything. If we approach the tip to the sample surface properly, this Z scanner is going to move up and stop at the middle of the, its position like this. So it's properly approached as by seeing the C scanner. And if you guys look at this upper um, C height line profile, the forward, which is the yellow line, and backward, which is the blue line, is matched to each other really well. That means that now the topography, which is the contact mode based uh, scanning, is working really well to each other. So let's move on to the SCM parameter. To see whether the SCM signal is good or not, we have to see SCM amplitude and SCM phase like this. But for now, there's not no signal or whatsoever and at this stage because we didn't set up the SCM parameter, not just the scan rate is too fast. Um, if I do slow it down a little bit. There's no signal, not yet, so we have to apply the proper SCM parameter. But to uh, apply the SCM parameter, there's a few step sequence you have to really follow, as you guys already know. First, we have to apply the AC bias to the sample. To apply AC bias and the reaction of the AC bias is just all controlled in the locking amplifier here. If you click this button, interlock amplifier modulator and input channel filter is going to come up. The upper side of this window is about reading the signal, like how much time constant you're going to apply and what filter you're going to apply to the raw data. And the bottom side is the modulator. Uh, to read the SCM signal, of course, we have to first apply the AC bias to between tip and sample so that we can make uh, right beneath the sample uh, tip approach to the sample surface, right beneath the uh, oxide layer where tip touches the sample, there's got to be a depletion local region. To make that local region to see the DCDV, we have to apply the AC. But for AC, actually, AC ha gotta have a frequent, certain frequency, and we know for SCM we normally use this 17 kilohertz of system bias. If you guys already saw the PFM webinar, actually we can um, modulate the AC bias with different kind of frequency. Why do we have to use the 17 kilohertz? It's not really needed. You've, of course, you can change it, but for SCM. No, for PFM, we kind of use the contact resonance or something in theoretical reason. If the tip touches the sample, that they have different kind of resonance frequency. But for a SCM, no, we don't use that kind of different frequency. Just use the 17 kilohertz and that's um, totally enough. And the bottom one, the drive, is the amplitude, the intensity of the AC bias you want to apply. So I'm going to use 4 here. Then instantly, the signal will have some kind of signal. 
by the AC bias because AC bias is the all we need to apply between tip and sample. That's the got to be the source of every signal. Right away, we can see a clear image. But still, the forward and backward is mismatching. That's why we need to uh, set up more parameter upper here. But before we set up this parameter, this by the applying AC bias between tip and sample, the raw data first go into the tip, right? And the tip reads the signal and send it back to the SCM resonator. That's why the input channel is connected to the HAM3 in. This is just the simple name uh, in POC systems, just as a simple labeling. And as the raw data signal from the tip goes into the SCM detector, we can see the SCM sweep here, that what the detector radio frequency peak is going to be like. So now the tip is touching the surface. So if we sweep the detector as it is, This kind of peak uh, is uh, graphing out like this. But if we detach the tip from the sample, that means that we're going to uh, reduce the tip sample interaction. And tip is not feeling any kind of capacitance signal from the sample because tip is uh, far away from the sample surface and sweep the, sweep the detector again. Then the, we can see the low low detector signal, which is just from the source from the SEM resonator. This peak is gonna be shifted to the left side uh, from the original peak, which is the source signal, because of the tip sample interaction. So let me approach the tip to sample again. And then if I sweep one more, this 647 megahertz peak is going to be shifted to 615 megahertz because of the tip sample interaction. Of course, uh, you can apply different power, lower power or higher power to the uh, RF source, original source, and change the gain, the sensitivity, how we can, we're going to measure the gather the uh, raw data detector signal and the total sensitivity of the detector at this window. It's all maximized right now. And the tip is scanning really fast, so let's slow it down and let's see what it's going to be like if you uh, sweep here and here. Because if you approach it here, this is the current approach position and sweep here. And then move on to the next position and sweep the same data. It's going to be different because it's, uh, as I al already mentioned, you guys already know, that this detector pick is affected by the low data of the uh, strip line, which is the DCDV signal low data. So if the DCDV is going to be changed, the pick shift is going to be affected by it. So if the approach position is uh, here, the detector is like 622. But if you move position a little bit uh, left or uh, different position or something, the peak shape or the peak uh, value is going to be different. And of course, if the peak shape is going to be different and peak value is going to change it, that's going to affect to the, the final data. So make sure before you really finalize the parameter setting and uh, press the scan button that you found the right pick 
of the radio frequency uh, versus frequency peak to see the maximized uh, clear final data. Okay, I think it's okay. And then let's move on to the final step of the parameter setting, which is, of course, the signal is generated by the modulator and went through the SCM resonator and go back to the lock-in amplifier as a last step. And the last final signal, uh, which came into the lock-in amplifier, is going to go through this filter and sensitivity factor is going to go in. And we can, of course, uh, change the time constant, which is the total averaging time of the final signal. Naturally, if I decrease the time constant to the half of the value, it's going to average in a short time compared to last one. So the signal, as you can see, is much noise, uh, a lot of noise is going in. But at the same time, each of these uh, different steps, like amplitude uh, region, have more uh, edgy uh, in the edge of the steps. So it's uh, quite a compensation whether you increase or decrease. The important thing is that the forward and backward line matches to each other really well since it's scanning the same line again and again. And of course, the signal to ratio is the most important thing. The filter order for the first one and the second one um, is a bit similar in this case, but normally second order, if you apply the filter, the signal looks a bit more blunt because the order is uh, much higher. But there's no uh, specific uh, parameter that you have to set at the first stage. What do I have to, what kind of value do I have to use for time constant sensitivity filter order? There's no such thing uh, designated to use as a first step. You have to see sample by sample, tip by tip, and situation by situation, whether it's good or not. So I think the second order is a bit better for the signal to noise wise, but if you change it to first order, it's a bit noisier, but the, uh, it's a step edge is more clear. So I'm gonna use the first order with the time constant of five milliseconds. Yeah, all the parameter setting for SCM is done. And the last step, the last thing that's really important, which makes the uh, Park Systems AFM um, much more in advantage compared to other competitors. One is just the quick step. By clicking this enable quick step, the quick step uh, step motion is gonna start right away. And you can change the pre-acquisition wait time. That means that each of the pixel is now gonna, tip is gonna wait until five milliseconds we are designated and then measure at the uh, specific amount of time so that it can be only measured while it's in contact at specific amount. So you can see it's much clearer. You can see a uh, much accurate SCM amplitude and SCM phase value since we use the quick step. And at this stage, if you increase the scan rate, like from 0 0.2, I increased it to 10, but it's not going to affect to the SCM amplitude and SCM phase data because uh, what we control here, the speed in as in scan rate, is the point in between measuring. So if, we are, if I increase this value, that does not going to affect to the total data. It's going to move faster in between each position of the measurement just so that we can make, it, make the measurement faster but uh, with the integrity, with the um, accuracy retaining at its best. So as we use the quick step, I think the um, measurement accuracy is increased, but still there's a lot of noise. So I'm gonna increase the time constant a little bit more. Then you can see your clear lines between. So I kept saying there's a step or step like lines here 
in amplitude because this sample as you guys already as you guys already saw has step like feature with different doping kind of con doping concentration uh, level in here SCM amplitude is smaller let's scan first in here uh, amplitude is uh, smaller but slowly increasing as uh, the step is uh, far away from the middle of the scanning line that means that amplitude is increasing uh, means the doping concentration is decreasing right so in the middle part the sample has higher doping concentration and it gets lower and lower that's why the SCM amplitude is increasing slowly and uh, in the middle part, of course, SCM phase it has very different value uh, considering the middle of the scanning line. That means that uh, the right hand side of the sample, the right hand side of the sample has has 90 degree plus, and the left hand side is minus 90 degree. That's uh, showing you guys that the sample in the left side and the right side has n type or p type uh, the different uh, type of the charge carrier so okay we uh, analyze the sample surface line by line let's move on to the image so what we are seeing here the left image of our window is the z height and uh, the surface topography and the right hand side image is the SCM quad, which is the multipl multiplication of SCM amplitude and SCM phase. Of course, you can see the amplitude and phase image like this. Uh, I think there's a, a line of uh, deformation here. That's why it's kind of a dead inside. But still, added pot has very clear step like feature in the middle. There was the amplitude was low, doping concentration was high, but slowly next next step it's slowly increasing the amplitude signal. That means that doping concentration is slowly decreasing. And at the right side of this amplitude, the phase is much higher and much lower. Clearly, the phase signal is really strong. That means that this side and this side have different type. And as a summarized uh, data, SCM quad has a plus zero value in the right hand side and minus zero value in the left side. And it's a step like increasing. That means that doping concentration in the end type is slowly uh, increasing and it's uh, changed its type to the different opposite charge carrier still with the decreasing of doping concentration The sample, uh, the surface, as you guys see in the Z height, sample surface has no specific feature compared to the SCM signal. Uh, in the middle part, as line here, I guess this is the, uh, the point where N and P type uh, charge carrier is going to be changed. But this kind of feature, the topographic feature, is not gonna not affecting to the um, SCM signal at this point. That's because the sample surface is really flat enough. I think the uh, peak to valley value is only like uh, 10 nanometer or something in average. 
that's really important in SEM measurement because SEM measurement uh, is uh, consisting of tip, oxide layer, and sample in a vertical way. So if the sample tip uh, tip end is gonna be blunt during the measurement, or some kind of contamination is attached to the tip end, so that tip end is uh, status of the tip end changes. That means the contact area of the sample tip is going to be changing. That's going to affect to the height, of course. But more importantly, SCM uh, data gathering system, data gathering path is going to be changed. So as a result, we're going to get an inaccurate data. We don't want to do that. So for measuring inaccurate, and of course, if there's not uh, no obstacle during the scanning mode, you're gonna get a faster image, faster data, faster imaging. So it's really important to maintain the sample surface really clean and flat for accurate measurement. Okay, sample has very un uh, uniform in a vertical way. So I think we've seen enough of the sample feature i'm gonna stop at the middle point of the scanning area and analyze this in xci's uh, analyst software and let's see This is the saved data. We're going to look at the SCM quad and height at the same time. Okay. So now we're looking at the height and SCM quad. Let's put a line in X scale and see in a uh, topography and capacitance signal at the same time. In the right hand side, you can see the red line, which is from the height, and green line, which is from the SCM quad. Without the topographic uh, effect on uh, SCM quad, SCM quad has very clear step like feature like this. Each of the step is slowly increasing and increasing. That means that the SCM, uh, the dopant concentration is slowly decreasing in the middle. And in the middle, as you guys already know, the type is changed, but slowly still, its value is slowly increasing. That means the doping concentration is decreasing. Of course, you can analyze uh, the data like this, but I'm going to show you an interesting factor that in the software you can render the height image in 3D like this. But at the same time, with containing, re retaining this kind of contour from the height uh, value, you can overlay a colored image on top, which means that the SCM quad, the doping concentration is going to be displayed in a color factor on top of the contour of the actual height value, like this. Let's see it more clearly in a uh, cutted image without the uh, unfinished area. Yeah, this is just a 3D image of the um, SCM quad, and this is the height. Okay. So on top of SCM height, I'm going to overlay um, SEM quad.
So like this, you can see a clear difference in the height like this, but without that height difference, we can see a slowly increasing SEM quad value on top of the contour of the 3D height, this. So in this way, you can check the, whether there's a topographic side effect or something. And of course, the um, crosstalk of the topographic effect and everything, but there's none with clear SEM quad uh, step-like feature. Okay, uh, thank you for listening. This is the end of the demonstration. So uh, this is the end of the talk. Thank you guys so much for having an interest on this webinar about scanning capacitance microscopy, which is the uh, most powerful tool to examine a semiconductor surface, which gives us the direct information of the capacitance. And also we measure the sample surface, which has different doping concentration and different doping type. I hope you guys enjoyed the actual demonstration. And if you guys have any question, you can ask me right away. Or if you guys have any list of the questionnaire, you can just email me right through the zoikimproxism.com or you can just email to our team. Okay, hope you guys have a safe uh, days and thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Zoe, for the uh, very nice uh, presentation. Uh, we have uh, Zoe Kim uh, on the line right now. So, uh, dear friends, uh, audience, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type in in the chat room. Uh, we'll go through it uh, together with Zoe uh, in a minute. All right. So, uh, I think we do not really have any questions from the audience. So, uh, just uh, another promotion to the audience. Uh, we have a series of webinars going on. So uh, please uh, subscribe and join us in another webinar series. Uh, if there's any topic that you think uh, you would like to see, uh, feel free to contact us as well. Uh, yeah. So far, I think we do not really have any questions. All right, so that's all for today. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us uh, this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are located at. And I wish you have a lovely day.